Almighty and everlasting God, we come as we are, as your children this morning. Those seeking you to, to encounter the Christ of Good Friday. The one who is on the cross. The one who is there and the one who we come seeking. So we ask more of you, Almighty God. Open our eyes and our hearts to your leading, moving, and directing. For we ask this in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us encounter afresh the cross of Calvary. The words that you spoke to us through that cross. The words that have been recorded in Scripture and have spoken to countless generations, but, but to us afresh a day, today, Almighty God, that we may encounter them and know you in them. For we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord now and always. Amen. So friends, as we come this morning, we, we've journeyed with Jesus. Do you remember this past Sunday, we, we had palm branches in the church. We, we had palm crosses in our hands, and we, we celebrated the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. We then journeyed through this week where, where we've encountered the sayings of Jesus building up to the cross at Bethany as he was blessed worshipped and true worship was there and he gave the word leave her alone then tuesday came and we had a moment in which the, the peculiar glory of christ was highlighted the work of christ that is a peculiar glory that the hour had come and that christ's work was beginning progressing towards the cross wednesday came and we we experienced in that moment the betrayal of Judas and of Peter. And there's a moment in which we were confronted in that reflective moment of our betrayals. Then we came last night and we, we celebrated Jesus bringing new into the Passover. Bringing a new meaning as we came into that Holy Communion, that, that cleansing of our hands, of our hearts, as we received the, the, the Passover meal, the, the sacred meal, the mud sauce and the grape juice. As we then progress through the journey of shadows that led us with Jesus to the cross of Calvary, where we find him this morning, on the cross, being crucified. They say that there's something special about the dying words of a person. You can tell much about the life of, of a person by the words that they choose to speak at their last. John Wesley is recorded in, on the, 27th, sorry, the 2nd of March, 1791, as having said, the best is yet to come. God is with us. So friends, as we this morning encounter the, the seven last words that Jesus spoke from the cross, I want to encourage you in this moment just to, to reflect and spend a moment. Because Jesus has, has gone through the flogging, through the beating. His body already been broken through that. And he's on the cross. And we encounter him on the cross. Penny, over to you. I read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 33 to 38. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is. God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the King of the Jews. They know not what they're doing. They do not know. They, they who killed Jesus, who is they? 
It's easy for us to point fingers and to blame others. The Romans, the crowd, Pilate, Herod, Caiaphas, they all played a part in this. They conspired against Jesus and so, or simply followed orders to maintain the peace, to keep Jesus' kingdom from interfering with theirs. We'd expect Jesus' first word to be something like, Father, help me, or, or even, my God, my God. But instead, Jesus prays for those who persecute him. Those who have caused him and are causing him pain. In this moment, he prays for them as he comes willing to endure the pain, the agony and the suffering of the cross. Jesus prayed for his enemies. He modeled what he taught. Surely Jesus should have got angry at the sinners that nailed him to the cross. Surely he should have been angered at us for the evil that we do. The evil we, we both do knowingly and unknowingly. Yet compassion is there. In this first word that he utters, Jesus prays for them and for us. Jesus intercedes for us before God the Father. Friends, do you realize that, that you need God's forgiveness? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let's just spend a moment in quiet. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today will be with me, you will be with me in paradise. In the second word we find a man without sin, a man with no sin, a man who never committed sin in the middle of two criminals, people that deserved to be there. Yes, no one deserved to die that way, but it was the law that if you are a criminal, then you will be crucified. And I love the Bible says one on the other side is still clueless of what is happening. He's busy insulting Jesus because I think in his mind he thinks you deserve to be here as well. And then the Bible says the one on the other side says you, you, you don't know what you're doing. And I can't help it friends but think maybe this other criminal had Jesus' first word when he said forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And then he thought this is my opportunity this is my time to receive the forgiveness. And then he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I love these magical words and I want you to remember this word. The first one, he says, truly, without doubt, definitely sure today. Not tomorrow, not next week, not the other day, but today you'll be with me in paradise. Truly, today. And paradise. Those are found are three magical words in this, in this word that Jesus is saying. Because Jesus is saying then, you know what? Now that you've confessed your sins, now that you know what you've done is wrong, I want to give you words of assurance. These are words of assurance coming from Jesus saying, not Anytime, you won't spend time, but today, which then says to us, when the body goes to the grave, the spirit of those who believe goes straight to the Lord, to with Jesus. And I love the Greek word for paradise, paradisio, which means a place of delight, a place of fairness, a place of love, a place of caring. Can you imagine that today, you'll be in the place of delight, a place of care, a place of love, a place of fairness. Why? Because you confessed your sin and you never blamed anyone but yourself. When we blame ourselves for what we've done, we go to a place of delight.
John 19 from verses 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Woman, behold your son. Friends, can you imagine the grief that is present in that moment? The grief of Mary as she stands there watching her son suffer. Grief so palpable, so real in that moment. The grief of Mary watching her son, her firstborn, die. The one who had been given by God, who angels had come and spoken about, hangs there. Dying. Can you understand the grief of a son? The son who must see his mother mourn. Jesus is responding to what he sees. What gift can a man, can a son give his mother in this moment? What can he offer her when he is gone? How can he help her? Hold her, comfort her, honor her. Woman, here is your son. Here is one I love to love you and for you to love. One who knows me, one who is my brother and who can speak of me. One who can hold you, comfort you, honor you. One who shares in this moment of palpable grief with you. Here is your mother. Here is one for you to love and to love you. The one who taught me. The one who fed me. The one who wiped away my tears. The one who hugged me. The one who grieves with you. Dear woman, here is your son. Mark 15, verse 34 to verse 33 to 34. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Aloy, Aloy, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are one of the heartbreaking words that come from the cross. Because for the first time in his journey, a few times in his journey, we hear Jesus, and, and I don't know where he got the strength, because the Bible says it was about three in the afternoon, and he's been there the whole day. But, but here's the amazing thing about this scripture, it says the darkness was all over the world, which then shows that at that moment, and it's one of the reasons I think the darkness symbolizes that God was not there. Or, or darkness symbolizes that you know, when we are in sin, we are not with God. And then we hear Jesus crying out loud, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you see, the sad part about this, it is because it is not because of his own doing. And I want you to note this, it's not because of his own doing, but it is because of our sake that is feeling separated from God. So Jesus is at the cross having done nothing wrong, having committed any sin, but because he knew that the price had to be paid by someone, so he was willing to go to a point of being separated to his father for our sake. Isn't that love at its best? Where you're saying, you know what, I know what this means. I know what I'm going to go through. I know the suffering I'm going to have. 
I know the darkness that I will see because why? I'm isolated from my father because of the sins of the world. So Jesus was in pain because now he understands the full punishment of sin. He understands the anger of God at that moment. He understands that God does not love sin. But yet, he still chose to go that route for you and me. So friends, whenever you commit sin, whenever you do something wrong, remember, remember this, that Jesus had to be in this state of being separated from God for your sake. So that he can show you and me that he loves us. So friends, this cry, and sometimes I, part of me believes the reason the author uses the word that he said it with a loud voice, I do not know, but I do believe maybe Jesus was crying to God and saying it is difficult not to feel your presence. It is difficult not to feel you around me, God. But yet, as difficult as it is, I am still going to do it. Because why? I love these people. I love these sinners. So friends, always remember, there was a moment where Jesus was forsaken by God for you. And for you alone. And the reason, it's because he loves you more than anything. Later, knowing that everything now had been finished, and so that scripture could be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. I thirst. I thirst. O oh my God, you are my God. I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Perhaps these are the words that Jesus is coming to, fulfilling. Perhaps he is living them out in this moment from Psalm 63. The thirst for water is a thirst for life. And a thirst for life is a thirst for God. A God who promises streams of living water in the desert. A mighty river in a dry land. As well as living waters to wash away every tear. As Jesus says these very personal words, they're a human statement. Jesus is there fully human in this moment in time. And we get to see a glimpse of this humanity on the cross. After about six hours of agony, lifting and pushing himself up to get a breath, enduring the work, the agony and the torture of the cross, the creator of water is thirsty. The one who has made it thirsts. Water to, to moisten a dehydrated mouth. Water to, to loosen a swollen tongue. To open a rough throat that can barely grasp air. Water to keep hope alive. To keep life alive just a few minutes longer. I thirst. John 6. John 19 verse 30. When he had finished receiving when he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I love the, the original wording or the Aramaic word for this because I do believe maybe he said it in Aramaic. It says, Tetelestai which means the debt has been paid in full. I don't know about you, but as a student, I don't know if you've ever owed an Ephesus or you've ever owed anyone money. Every time they phone you, you see their name on your phone, you think, oh God, what am I going to say? 
because they're going to ask for their money and all of that. And the moment you pay them, sometimes you wish you could call them and say, how are you doing today? I'm just checking if you're okay. Because you don't owe them anymore. You don't feel guilty. So you want to just play with them. So what Jesus is saying here, friends, I'm saying this is the word of victory. This is time for you and me to celebrate because our sins have been paid for. We no longer owe God anything because Jesus died for me and you. We are cleansed of sin. So what Jesus is saying here is saying, before I even die, I want to confirm this, that the work that I've been sent by my father to do, I've done it. And I've done it well. So now that means there's victory over sin, there's victory over death. So death has no power over you, sin has no power over you. Why? Because God paid it by the death of his son. So these are the words of celebration, words of accomplishment, words of knowing that you can no longer make excuse when you sin because it's all been paid for by price. That is the death of Jesus Christ. So friends, BMC family, I'm saying to you, as, as you leave this place, I know because your Lord died, you would want to leave it, you know, with, yes, we are encouraged that you leave it with quietness, but my wish is that when you go out there and speak to the people, just say to them, you know what? Tetelestai, my debt has been paid in full. Sin has no power over me. Death has no power over me. That's the beauty of the death of Jesus Christ. It was not in vain. It was for me and you. So then, therefore, that means when you walk around the streets, stop it. Stop walking as if sin has defeated you or your problems have overcome you. You must pick up your head, walk tall, because you know your Redeemer lives. You know He died for you. You know you are not a sinner anymore, but you are a child of God saved by grace because God loves you. It is finished. Luke 23, verse 44 to 49. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun had stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the woman who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Into your hands. I commit my spirit. It is the end, the, the very end of the suffering. Jesus has been there for over six hours. His back raw from the whipping he received. Nails through his hands. Twisted and pushing up and down to get breath. Tortured. Exhausted. Abandoned by his friends who had scattered. Forsaken by God. As Jesus gasps for the last breath. As he gathers strength for that final victory cry. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus has a choice. It's a cry that God wasn't the only one intended to hear. A cry that we too might hear the final dedication of Jesus' soul. A dedication made despite the pain, despite the mocking, the agony, the sense of horrible aloneness that he felt. Dedication made to God before the resurrection, before the victory of the kingdom, before any assurance other than that which faith could bring. Jesus entrusts his spirit, his life, and all that was given to God in faith. Even at, at this point of his own abandonment, when good seems so far away, he proclaims his faith in God, and the darkness cannot overcome it. 
can never overcome it. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit.